We just looked at the power rule, and at the end of all that, we found that the integral of 1 over x, although it looks like a lot of other similar functions, 1 over x squared, 1 over x cubed, we can't do it in the same way. We can't use the power rule to apply to this one. So we need a special rule to handle just this one on its own, and thankfully we can remember one that we memorized with derivatives. If you remember when we learned derivatives, we learned that the derivative of one function was 1 over x, and you should remember that, that function was the natural log function. So the derivative of the natural log function is 1 over x, and the integral of 1 over x is the natural log function. So that's a special case, this reciprocal function. And I want to mention real quick that if you see something like the integral of 1 over x squared, sometimes you might be tempted to say, that looks like 1 over x, so it must use the same rule. So the answer to this would be the natural log of x squared plus c. But I want to caution you that's not true. 1 over x to any other power other than 1 uses the power rule. It's only 1 over x that needs this special rule. It's only 1 over x that turns into the natural log function. You might also be tempted to say that the integral or the antiderivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. And that's also not true. It's the derivative of the natural log that's 1 over x. It's the integral of 1 over x that's the natural log. So just watch out for those little uh, errors that are common and you'll be okay. As far as what the integral of the natural log of x is, we'll actually have to wait for a couple of sections to find that out. When we learn how to do integration by parts, we can actually figure out what the integral of the natural log function is. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so that's the reciprocal function, one special case, and beyond that, it's pretty straightforward. The next category, kind of following along with what we learned with derivatives, we get to exponential functions. And just like with derivatives, this is nice and easy because the derivative of the natural exponential function, so if we're working with e to the x, its derivative is itself. That's the easiest derivative function at all. So it's also the easiest integral. The integral of e to the x is just e to the x plus c. If we go to something like 2 to the x or some other base, then you just have to remember the rules for differentiating things like that. So this is one that you should have memorized. But if you have something like 2 to the x, I'll remind you what the derivative rule was. The derivative of 2 to the x is the natural log of 2 times 2 to the x. Or you might write 2 to the x times the natural log of 2. So if that's the case, then if we're going to take the antiderivative, notice that when we took the derivative, we ended up with the same function with the same base, and we multiplied by the natural log of that base. So if we're thinking about undoing or reversing this process, in the same way, if we take the antiderivative, or the integral, of 2 to the x, we're going to wind up with 2 to the x in our answer. And instead of multiplying by the natural log of 2, it should make sense that we're going to divide by the natural log of 2. So that if we were to reverse that process and take the derivative of that answer that I just wrote down, then we would end up with the correct result the multiplication and division would cancel each other out. So in general, the antiderivative or the uh, integral of b to the x is 1 over the natural log of b times b to the x. Or you might see people write b to the x over the natural log of b, either way. Notice that, of course, applies also to e to the x. If you plug in e in the place of that base, you end up with 1 over the natural log of e, which is just 1, times e to the x plus c. So this is a special case of that more general rule at the bottom. So the general rule for the exponential functions is that one there. It's not too bad as long as you remember your derivatives for exponential functions. Otherwise, it's just a matter of memorization. The last category of functions that we'll talk about here is your trig functions. So just to remind you, 
you've got the derivatives for sine of x, cosine of x, tangent of x. And then, of course, you've got secant, cosecant, and cotangent. So these should all be ones that you memorized back in Calc 1. The derivative of the sine function is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. And the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And hopefully when you learn these derivatives, you saw the symmetry to this pattern, where if you take the derivative of one of these functions, like sine of x, and then you look over at its co-function. So the co-function of sine is cosine, right? So if you look at the derivative of the sine and the derivative of its co-function together, you notice a pattern that to get from this answer to that answer, you just replace the function in the answer, which is cosine, with its co-function, which is sine, and you flip the sign, the sine. You flip it and make it negative. Now that pattern sounds confusing, but when you notice it on the other ones, it's the exact same pattern. If you're looking from secant to cosecant, to change from the answer for secant to cosecant, you replace secant with cosecant, tangent with cotangent, and you make it negative. If you go from tangent to cotangent, you replace secant with cosecant and make it negative. So that pattern can help memorize this list of derivatives. Okay, but once you see that, for our purposes we're focused on the antiderivatives, so we can just reverse all of these. So for instance, we can say the integral of the cosine function would be sine of x plus c. The integral of the sine function, on the other hand, be careful with this negative sine, <clears throat> the integral of the sine function would be negative cosine of x plus c. And those two, just like with derivatives, you need to watch out for that negative sign. And just be careful, make sure that you think it through and remember which one ends up being negative. The integral of cosine is positive sine because the derivative of sine is positive cosine. And then the others that work the same way. So you have the integral of the secant squared function is tangent. The integral of secant tangent is secant, and so on. Okay, some of these you'll use more often than others. You'll use the cosine and sine ones very often, and then the secant squared and secant tangent you'll use fairly often. The last two we won't see very often, but it's good to include them just for thoroughness sake. But otherwise, make sure that you know at least those first four very, very comfortably, because we'll use them both when we're doing integrals, and also when we do some u substitution, we will notice that these kind of things will come in handy, remembering those derivatives. So just make sure that you're familiar with this list and that it's nothing too new. So we've seen the basic integrals that you should know at this point, using the power rule, the reciprocal function, the exponential functions, the trig functions. There are a few other things you learned how to differentiate, like the inverse trig functions. We're not gonna worry about those at this point, although we, we will see them show up a little bit later, but for now we'll leave those to the side. And there were a couple other rules of integration. Things like if I integrate the sum of two functions, 
I can split that up and handle one of them at a time. And then the other. So for example, if I wanted to integrate x squared minus 6x plus 3, I could take that one term at a time. So we could integrate x squared first and get 1 third x to the third, and then minus integrate 6x and get 6 times x squared divided by 2, or 3x squared, and then plus the integral of 3 is 3x plus c. So that rule comes in handy when we need to split up an integral with addition and subtraction. And that's because if you look back at your rules for derivatives, the same thing held true. If you were adding or subtracting pieces together, you could take one piece at a time. But remember carefully that when you did a product of two things, you couldn't just differentiate each piece individually. You had to learn a product rule. With integrals, it's the same idea. We can't integrate a product one piece at a time and we don't quite have a product rule for integrals, but we'll see something kind of similar here in a few lessons. But stay tuned for that. And then there was another rule where if you have the integral of a constant times a function, we've already used this, you can pull the constant out in front. So for instance, if we have something like the integral of 6x, like we just did on the last example, you could pull the 6 out in front and just integrate the x by itself, which would give you 6 times 1 half x squared, or 3x squared. So we've already used that, and it's not a really complicated rule, but it comes in handy too that constants can be carried along just like they were with derivatives, and then we just look at the remainder of the function. Now with these rules, these two rules we just wrote down, as well as the basic integrals that we've covered to this point, we really have the foundation of everything we're going to learn how to do. Starting in the next section, we're going to learn other integration methods, but it's going to turn out that all of the integrals we do are really going to be one of this list of functions that we've seen here. So you need to make sure that these rules are very straightforward and that you're very comfortable with them, because everything else is going to build off of here. And we're going to learn ways to approach more complicated integrals by basically breaking them down and simplifying them to one of these. And that's going to be the, the hard part of the integration methods, is figuring out how to simplify to one of these. But you should always keep in mind kind of your library of functions that you know how to integrate. <clears throat> you know how to integrate x to a power, including some of these more exotic variations. <clears throat> you know how to integrate 1 over x. You know how to integrate something to the power of x, and these trig functions. So your goal is always going to be, with later problems, to break down the problem into one of these forms and to find the closest form that will work. So keep that in mind as we get into more complicated methods that really all of the integrals that you'll learn how to do, you already know. They're all in this list, and more complicated methods just build off of this and combine these in different ways.